welcome to 10 Talks. Today's conversation is all about how women win. And interesting enough, we've got a great volleyball coach on with us who's going to share some winning strategies. He's coaching women's volleyball at Stanford, and we're going to get to hear some winning strategies. And it's going to be an enjoyable conversation. So Kathy, introduce our guest for us. Well, it may seem a little bit counterintuitive that in a podcast and a project named How Women Win, you interview men. Um, but we decided that there are men that we know that have thought about this a lot. And we wanted to talk to uh, some men who are not only mentoring female student athletes as their job, uh, but have also taken on as another part, part of it is uh, mentoring female coaches. So Kevin, thanks for joining us. Kevin Hambly uh, played for the national championship at uh, when he was a coach at Illinois, has won two national championships as a coach at Stanford. So plenty successful. Uh, been at this for quite a while. So yeah, Kevin, tell us. Tell us who you are. Uh, well, I am... Uh... Yeah, I'm Kevin. You guys mentioned I'm the coach at Stanford. Who am I? Uh, I am a person that um, really loves the sport of volleyball. That, but uh, mostly uh, and and enjoy studying the game and and get, and trying to I don't know learn. I'm like I feel I feel like I'm a I'm a person that's constantly trying to learn more. Um, and but more importantly, I'm a person that the reason I'm in collegiate volleyball is because I really enjoy being around the athletes and helping them grow. I think that's, people talk to me all the time, like what's the juice? I was out in Turkey hanging out with Giovanni Gadetti and him and I were on the same path when we were young. I spent a week out there and he's going, Kevin, well, by the way, his staff has not one female on it. It's like eight dudes and him. And so he's, you know, he's asking me, uh, hey, Kevin, like, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you here professional? My answer is pretty simple. It's, I, I don't do it just for the volleyball. I do it to help young women grow and, and help be some have some influence on their lives and hopefully help them on their path to being great human beings great players and all that kind of stuff so i think who am i that's you know if from a work standpoint that's kind of who i am i'm trying to help young women uh empower young women to be the best they possibly can be well and kevin what got you into as a player you know you definitely were competitive and you were in that competitive zone, what transitioned you into being like, wow, I really want to empower young women? Yeah, I think when I first started coaching on what young women, I decided this is way, like, way more interesting, way more exciting. Um, you know, I, to be honest, there was more opportunities in coaching. So that, you know, that that helped a little bit. But once I got into it, I had some chances to go coach men and I didn't want to go that route. I wanted to stay on the women's side. So uh, I think um, I, just as I got around women, just honestly, uh, being around a lot of them, even including like high level internet, like women that have played international, they really struggle with confidence. And, um, with like the dudes that I coach with, if they were struggling with confidence, they did a good job of hiding it and like kind of, um, faking that they didn't, but the women really struggled. So I, I remember thinking I was coaching, I coached club with Bob Kelly, who was at Nevada Juniors. That was my first experience coaching girls. Uh, coached an 18s team with him, and I was struck by how um, how they lack the women lack confidence. Unfortunately, here's some women that played at Long Beach State, Pepperdine, Loyola Marymount. Like they had, they, these guys were great players. And I thought, okay, when you get to a higher level and you coach something, that that's not going to be an issue. And then I'm coaching the junior national team, who had three Olympians on that team eventually, and they were having the same struggles. And then I coached the national team and they had the same struggles. And so I just was, was wanted to help these young women, mostly at the beginning stages, like these guys are amazing. How can I, is there any influence that I can have to help them be more confident and believe in themselves and build them up? And that really started kind of me on that path, if that, being honest, just like, I feel like there's some work that can be done here. I'm not the only one that can do it, but I'd like to help these young women, so. And they're so eager to so eager to learn and so trusting and all that stuff. It was just just intrigued me. And as I got into it more and saw the power of um, females working together, it's just so it's so much more powerful to me than the men's teams that I was on. It's just uh, when you get a group of women working together, it's it's like nothing else that I've been around. 
And did you come to being able to coach women and relate to to them and and who they were and help them? Did you come to that naturally? I mean, did you just have no, those instincts, or did you have to change to be able think, to be good at it? Yeah, sorry, Kathy. I I think I'm still trying to change to be good at it. Right. I think I think. Uh, when I first got into coaching, well, I first, the first, my real first experience coaching was boy, it was boys. And, you know, all I did was like yell and scream at them and talk trash and be a complete ass to them. And they would, they responded great. If they, you know, my one tool that I had, if they weren't playing hard, I'd get a red card or a yellow card. And all of a sudden they'd just be like, yes, coach, like we're behind you. And I tr- so I tried that with the women and tried to control them at some level and it wasn't going to work and it didn't work. And so I've kind of over time, you know, through trial and error and a lot of mistakes, um, just try to evaluate what works and what doesn't work. And I think, you know, times are changing. The athletes continue to change. And um, I hear a lot of people complaining about the athletes at this time. I don't understand that. This, this, these women right now that I'm coaching are my favorite group of women that I've ever coached. Just, I think their level of empathy and awareness and of, of um, what's going on in the world and their, um, ex- I, I want to say acceptance, because that word used a lot for different ideas and thoughts and sexualities and all that stuff. It's like, there's not, never been anything like this. And I just find it really refreshing. And, and um, I don't know, they just seem very special to me, but I think we've had, I've had to ad- adapt and adjust. And, you know, I listen a lot to the athletes and what they want. And I talk to them a lot and just try to be honest with myself about how can I be the best for them. So I hope I continue to evolve, but I certainly have evolved even in the last five years. I think that'll continue hopefully until I'm done with the sport or it's done with me, one or the other, you know, which probably is what'll happen first. They'll be done with me before I'm done with it. Evan, one thing that all of our coaches that we've had the honor of interviewing have said is to, you know, be your authentic self. When we talk about how women win is to be authentic. And you talk about just the transformation that you've gone from men's sports into women's sports. How have you stayed authentic to yourself and changed to actually be better for as a women's coach? I don't think that I'm, um, I was ever anything. Like I've always been myself. I've always been pretty comfortable in my own skin. Even when I was a college player being myself, I think, um, really the one place that I wasn't was when I played volleyball is that I was an absolute maniac, like just a maniac and that I needed, I know it was the era of trash talk and, you know, Michael Jordan, like stirring stuff up. And those are the people that you look to, right? Like looking for someone would say something under his breath. And in my mind, that was, that was, uh, he was talking trash about me and I'm going to, I'm going to use that as motivation like that. You know, I was like, so crazy when I look back on it, but that's how what I needed, what I needed to get motivated to play. And I felt that when I got into coaching, that's, that is, um, who I am, I guess, like, or that's who, what I needed to be. And, uh, and there is that in me that like fire and that competitiveness and that need to control things and all that. But um, like who I am walking around town, like talking to you is, is the, like, I'm just pretty laid back and calm. And I think as I've become more comfortable into coaching and, and as I've done it longer, um, I just kind of settled into that. Like instead of, instead of forcing myself to be something else in the volleyball world or something else as a player or as a coach, I just allowed myself to be myself. And, and, and then that, I think that served me really well because then you're not, there's no, you're not hiding from, you're not, you're always, if you're always authentic and if you're always being yourself and you already, it's probably been talked at ad nauseum here, um, the team knows who you are and, and they can trust you more. If you're trying to be something, that's when you get in a lot of trouble. So um, I certainly have become a better coach as I've gotten more comfortable just being myself. So we talked to quite a few female coaches, and one of the themes that um, that that has come out is that um, some some of the women um, were very much motivated, like you, challenge. You know what? You know you're in my face. Okay, I'll I'll prove it to you. I'll show you that. You know, uh, the more people yelled, the more intimidating they were. Um, you know, the more motivated, but that a lot of women are absolutely not motivated that way. And so right. if that's how, if, if as a player, you needed that, you needed that challenge to, um, to play hard, then, I mean, 
help me understand how how you discovered that there's a or maybe I'm maybe I'm the outlier, yeah. but that there were women that didn't need that. In fact, not only did they not need it, but they were going to crash. I, I just I have, I found as I got into coaching, like I did that to myself. You know, like I played for Carl McGowan. He didn't do that for me. Right. You know, he right. he wasn't that he wasn't trying to he wasn't talking trash to me. And he wasn't trying to we weren't operating out of fear. Right. So like I think because of my own insecurities, I needed as a player and as a person and on the volleyball court as a young player. I needed a sort. I needed something that was gonna. I needed to, could fixate on that. I was gonna that was gonna help me um, stay motivated and compete at a, a high level. As I got older and I played professional, that all went away. I didn't need that anymore. You know, mm -hmm. I think, and I look back on it. It was a very unhealthy relationship with volleyball. Really, I think that's a like. I think I was really operating out of fear and anger and insecurity and. Um, I'm not sure that anyone really operates really, really well out of that space, you know? So what, instead of like, as we have athletes here, we're trying, I'm trying to do the opposite, you know, like with them, I'm trying to get them to operate out of a place of like love of the sport and just trying to excel and create an environment where, um, where they feel like they can make the mistakes and aren't afraid to make mistakes and grow. Like we actually talked about running to errors and trying to create that environment. And to me, I found that the, that that has been more motivating for my athletes in recent times than any team that I've ever coached that was operating out of that fear and insecurity. And it's way more powerful than that, um, yeah, that relying on anger, that actually like kind of doing it out of love. I mean, that sounds corny, but really that's what it is. And trying to grow has been more powerful, to be honest. And um, I got a new staff and we just had this conversation the other day and they're just, it was just really interesting to talk about how like our, the kids are here, they're, they, they're, they're playing with freedom, the freedom to make mistakes. The women are like, they're strong, they're, they feel empowered and they can, um, when they practice and they compete, they're, they're not afraid to make the mistakes. They're not looking over their shoulder and they make a mistake. They're just trying to grow and be better. And, but there's this level of like kind of casualness to it. That's like, uh, it's like this casual, um, high level, uh, group that's trying to excel at a, at the highest level they possibly can. And it's, really fun for me it's really fun to be a part of that but really hard to create that because i think most of them come out of a space where fear is their greatest motivator and that seems like a very unhealthy space and we're trying to make it healthier for them kevin how do you do that in practice how do you set up a practice environment that's competitive and yet fun and and casual as you've said yeah i think uh first off i'm i operate that way so you kind of set that to set the tone right mm -hmm. and then i think really how you respond to mistakes and errors and how you respond to things that go on in practice that are behaviors that are outside of how you, what you, what you think is going to help you be successful is the key. Cause I, I could ruin that vibe very, very quickly. The first time my hitter is trying to do something. I, I mean, a good example is if someone's trying to work on the line shot and they miss three line shots in a row and I start screaming at them about making the mistake where I know like their intentions are there, their efforts there, they're trying to do that. Instead, I celebrate those mistakes. Like that's keep going for that. Keep working on that. But if I responded poorly, I think, and if I respond poorly once, if I respond poorly twice, all of a sudden they can't trust that they can go make those mistakes and, and, and feel like they can feel that freedom to go out and try to be the best they can. So I think it's less about how do I create it? It's like, how do I not ruin it? I mean, we talk about it, we get on it, but I could ruin it so fast and did a lot when I was younger. And so, um, yeah, I set the tone and then make sure we get out of the way. And, and, and then if they're not, you know, freshmen come in and they're not sure how to respond, then we're just encouraging them to operate that way, you know? And I think that it's conversations that are happening all the time. Like, Hey, look, seeing you playing out of fear right now. I don't, you know, that's not, is that, is that how you want to play? Cause it sure seems like, uh, it's not the healthiest and healthiest relationship with volleyball. And then, um, it's also, not serving you very well because you're not really growing the way you need to. And just on that topic, a lot of times what ends up coming up, to be honest, is their identity being wrapped up in volleyball and that, that volleyball players and not, uh, you know, a human being that's playing volleyball. I guess it's a separation of who they are from what they do. I think, you know, if you're a lot of young athletes come in and they've been, they're the volleyball player on campus and especially our kids, you know, like they're, over their high level players and that's how they've been identified and so when they're out there playing and 
Um, they make a mistake. If their identity is wrapped up in that, all of a sudden I'm not okay as a player. So then I'm not okay as a person. And I think, you know, working through some of that and trying to uncouple those two things has become really important. And I think it's really important in coaching as well. So yeah, I was going to say that's a perfect segue uh, to talking about uh, women coaches. And I know that you've, you know, you've had uh, female assistants, uh, you've taken it uh, on yourself to, um, to, to raise them, if you will, to want to be head coaches and to be head coaches. How you help your assistants and how do you help younger coaches make that transition because it's the same deal you know now I'm the head coach and my team looks like they're not being coached and so now all of a sudden I'm not a good person and so I throw a fit or yeah or or I withdraw the team is losing so like I am failing as a human being and then how's that how's that manifest itself usually People take it out on the team and that's how they lose their team. Yeah, it's either anger or withdrawal, depending yeah, introvert, true. extrovert, um, exactly. you know, but yeah. but yeah, it's it's like I mean, we're not coaching anymore. Yeah, no, it's no, we're, we're protecting ourselves. We're in survival mode. And so I, I mean, to answer, but the identity piece, I mean, those, those are two different things, right? Those are something that we talk about a lot, to be honest, like, the, like I talk about that a lot with the staff and I talk about that a lot with our team. Like this is a conversation that's happening all the time because I, I think if you if you break that things down to lowest common denominator with issues, a lot of times it's wrapped up in that for student athletes and for coaches. Like their struggle is wrapped up in that identity piece. So that conversation is happening a lot now. Um, how, that, that's one p- part of trying to have coaches have a healthy relationship with the their profession, right? I think that's that's how I look at it. This is more about how do you have a healthy relationship with this? Like I feel like I have a very, very healthy relationship with coaching and who I am as a human being. Like I know when my team struggles, I'm still okay as a human being. And so like, first I set that example, talk about it a lot. Um, If I see as it's happened a lot, my assistants struggling when, you know, their role, they're struggling with that. And you see it like taking a toll on them. I'm, you know, I'll call that out and communicate it. I'm, I'm just a pretty upfront um, communicator. If I see things, I, I call it out and I say it and it sounds very combative, but it all comes out of a place of love. Like, Hey, I care about you. You know, in you, this is, you're struggling, you're managing the setters, our setter struggling. I see you struggling more than you should. Like you're doing the, you're doing the best you can, you know, try to call those things out. So that's one piece, but I, I think, you know, how do, how do we develop women and get them in coaching? I've been successful and unsuccessful in doing that. Certainly. Um, for me, like the first thing is, um, you know, I got to set a good example of what, what I think is a healthy culture that you can operate in. And also, how do you have a healthy relationship with your family inside this with the program? You know, I think, um, you know, like my kids are in the gym, my daughter, especially when we first got here for the first two years, like she's busy doing her own thing now, but she would hang out in our gym and do her homework in the gym and be around our team. And like, we had to figure this out. And I, you know, go to doctor's appointments and you know, we, like, I think showing that you can be a parent and you can be a coach, that's one part of it. Cause I think that's what takes a lot of them out and it's taken most of mine out despite that, you know, I also tell them all like, Hey, I'm willing to work with you at whatever level we can. You have kids. Like, I mean, um, Alicia glass, when she was here, who I'm hoping gets back into college coaching at some point, but she just had her third child and it's just too much. And really she has got stuff going on with her husband. I'm like, Hey, what time can you get here for a t- staff meeting? Do the rest of your stuff at home. You can scout, you know, all the other responsibilities, do it at home. But what time can you get here? Let's set the schedule around that so we can keep you in this, you know? So I think like, I think trying to work with them to give them an opportunity to actually go through with it and make it work and did the same thing with Jen Oldenburg when she was with me and Aaron Lindsay when she was with me and, you know, those guys trying to make that work. So it set it that way, but also like talk about the culture and then show and talk about, um, you know, like here's how to manage the athletes and I don't know, just be a great example, I guess is the best way you can do it. And then, and, and be open and honest about the communicate and communicate to the staff about what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, why I'm doing it and all that, trying to set that tone. And then the conversation always is here's how I'm doing it. Cause this works for me. You got to figure out what works for you, but here's the principles behind what I'm doing. Do you think 
women have advantages in coaching? And do you think men have advantages in coaching? So I'm, I, w- I want to hear your, your thoughts on both sides. Do you think that women coaches coaching women's teams have advantages? I think there's some advantages that the, if um, used right, like I think there's some, the emotional quotient, like typically I've, the women I've been around have a better sense of what's going on with the team. That's like a broad generalization. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's been some women that have that I've been around that have no EQ, to be honest. So I'm not like there's just there's a wide variety of that, but they're used to dealing with like women. They've been on the team. They can, especially ones that have played at a high level. They there's um, it's easier for them to empathize uh, to with what's going on. Uh, I think the greatest disadvantage is if they want to have a family. Like there's that that does that's what's ended up pulling up every one of my female pulling my females out is that they want to have a family. Courtney, Courtney Thompson was just with me, who I think could be an incredible coach. She's an incredible leader. She's just got this unbelievable vibe that is like, it's infectious and you want to be around her. People would want to follow her. She wants to have kids and she doesn't feel like she can do it in this profession. And I was trying to convince her she can and work with her, but she just decided she can't. So I think that's the greatest disadvantage, which, you know, for me, like, I want to be a dad. And like, I, this is, this is tough. Like it's tough on the, on the family and we've made sacrifices and we were with Aaron Lindsay and Jen Oldenburg and both cases, they married a person that was willing to be at home and be with the kids. And, and they, they married the right spouse. But right. so I think in order to, to, to mitigate that disadvantage of having kids, if you got to marry the right person, that's willing to step aside. I mean, I remember talking to Steve Oldenburg, like, dude, Jen has way more earning power than you. No offense. Like you're a great strength coach and like, you probably could do a great job here, but the earning power that Jen has is like, it's, it's obviously she's, she's starting to tap into that now, you know, and I think same for Aaron Lindsay, her husband realized that as well, you know? So I think they, they married spouses that got it and saw it, but same for me, if my spouse didn't get it, I wouldn't be able to get in this profession. My, my wife knows that's what makes me tick. And she's, so she's like, she's helping me make that work. So I think both cases that could be the, the, the advantage and disadvantage for the men's side, like for the men was a disadvantage there. I think a lot of guys, um, unfortunately, the, they, they try to be very controlling of the athletes. They think that's the way to go about it. They use fear a lot for whatever reason, especially guys that haven't played at a high level. I think like the, the models that they've had are these like, I'm going to be a little bit, um, I don't care. I'm just going to say what I think. Little guys controlling big women like that little, so there's a, a lot of that, and that's the model that they've used, and it creates this really unhealthy culture. And I think that affects their ability to have success more than um, than anything is the modeling that they've had. So I know that's going to be controversial with people that listen to this, but I, it's real, so I'm not afraid to talk about it. Well, when you're talking about just the women going, not choosing to stay in the profession and have children it could come back to confidence again. And you started our conversation with confidence. And I just want to, you know, unpack that a bit more because I think, as you said, as a man, you knew you wanted to be a great volleyball coach and you wanted to be a father. There wasn't an, or you knew that you could do both of it. And that's the confidence we want women to have is to be able to say, you know what? Yes, I can be a great coach. And yes, I can be a great mom. And yes, having a great partner is part of it. Let's just kind of leave those alone because those are personal choices. How would you say you've set your women that you've had the honor of coaching up for just gaining confidence and having great confidence? Well, I think in the gym, you know, like trying to find them like you with your athletes, like doing stuff that's right and like trying to like build them up, you know, like, like, or just like, Hey, you're doing a great job here. Like nice work, you know, like, um, same as you would just catch people doing the things that are right. Um, I think from the aspect of beyond just like in the gym, um, trying to help them see a path where they can make this work and sustainable, you know, and like, what can we do to like, what is that path and, um, you know, help them understand that it is, they are capable of that. I mean, I was working on Jen for Oldenburg. She, I mean, she was in and she got out because of kids and now she's back. I was working on her for the whole time, you know, like, Every time my job opened, like, come back, come get one of these great head coaching jobs. You know, like, please, I would literally called every time the job opened up because I just know what she could be because she didn't see the path. And then it was like, no, there's a path here, Jen. I think she finally saw the path. So trying to help them see the path to make this work, you know, but um, I, I mean, I don't know. I think 
to helping teaching, helping guide, helping helping them understand the game at a high level so they know they can be at a high level gym and be able to teach it. And then kind of building up when they're doing it right, just like you would train an athlete, try to train the coaches the same. Are there structural things? I mean, I, I know um, I went to Athletes Unlimited um, to their opening day and I see Alicia coming from around the other side of the curtain yeah. and I'm like what are you doing here yeah <laughs> you know where are the ball. kids or yeah. whatever yeah. and everything and and she said no they're here with me uh, the nanny's here uh, my husband's coming in every couple of weeks and everything and uh, and you know athletes unlimited is is funding it they've said they're committed to women's professional sports and that you can't be committed to women's professional sports if you don't do these things are those things that you think structurally can happen with colleges, I mean, I guess particular. I mean, they can't happen. They can't happen at the mid-major level, and they can't happen at the poor level. But could they happen at the top level for for schools that are committed to women coaches? I mean, there are women that there are coaches that are doing it. They, they have that kind of support, right? Like Christy Johnson. I think she's through mm -hmm. that now. Mm -hmm. But for a long time, they they let her bring a nanny on the road, or helped pay for the nanny on the road, or allowed her to have kids in the office. Allow. I mean, I think there's ways to make that work. I think. You know, at this, if you're trying to play at the highest level, the amount of time that you're on the road is, is probably more significant than it is if you're at a mid-major level. So maybe that kind of, you don't need as much support, but I still think you need some of that support. But to me, this is a commitment that the ADs need to make to, to hire women, you know, and especially women that have families. And, you know, right now, you're the, the women that have gotten jobs, for the most part, our young female assistants have gotten the biggest jobs because they're not tied down to having kids yet. Not a lot of them aren't. And so the, to me, those administrators need to grow and, and help them with that. You know, even, even um, uh, you and I were both talking about like Salima, when Salima was going mm -hmm. to Notre Dame, we had those conversations as they started to go down that path to hire. I'm like, you need to offer support. Like if you're going to bring Salima in, who's been at home with their kids and then doing, you know, TV, like you, that needs to be part of this package, just figuring out how to offer. That it. needs to be where the conversation starts. Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't need to start with, we're going to pay you this much money. We want you to win at this level. And here's our facilities. It needs right. to start with, you know, yeah. It can't just we be want like, to talk. Here. Yeah. We want to yeah. talk to you about, uh, uh, about how this is the right place for you and your family. Right. We, we were talking to you because we think you're, you're a good hire for a coach. Right. But now how, well, what can we do to make sure you have success? And right, that's a right. huge part of it, you know, it's a huge part. Yeah. yeah. And most administrations are like, here's money, go perform. Right. And right. it's like, it would be, to me, it'd be better served. Like, here's a little less, let's take some of that money and let's, right. let's support you. Because right. most of that money that you're going to, that chunk that they're going to take out of that or whatever, or hopefully they just add more, of course, but like <laughs> whatever you put in that is probably what's going to go to support anyway, that they got to go search out and go find and all right. that. So why not just take care of that up front and be like, Hey, look, here's what we're offering you. Here's how we're going to help you. And, mm -hmm. and then here's all the ways that we're going to support you. I feel like, well, I feel like two things happen with that development piece. So one thing is that a lot of male co head coaches or female head coaches, when they hire a female, they're just recruiting coordinators and that's all they are right mm -hmm. and so like then they're not actually preparing them to be ready to be like coaches and head coaches and right practices and all that head coaches right. yeah right and so like i think that that's one piece that like if we're like as coaches as head coaches trying to develop assistants like um courtney and um aaron Lindsay and um my last three female assistants and and um, alicia glass they were not my recruiting coordinators they were they were my volleyball people they were the ones that were doing the scouts they're the ones that like i was mm -hmm. most relying on the right practice you know all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff and i think that going back to like how do we help develop them like they, they have to play that role that they can have the confidence to get in the gym and like do a scout and and like run training and because a lot of them that i talked to a lot of females that i talked to so i'm going through the hiring process have only been the recruiting coordinator. That's all yeah. they've been. And so like the same thing goes, like a lot of these, you're hiring these young females, like a lot of them have not had a lot of experience that they need. Administrations need to do the same thing as like put them in situations and offer them support and help help them develop all the skills necessary to be a head coach. Because so many, I think about um, Teacher Collins when I got there, her first head coaching job, I was there with her. Now I was a young punk and had no idea, nor could I help. Like I had no idea what we were doing, but she, got put in a job starting a program from scratch with no support right. no idea and right. not really like i mean she had she worked for some people but they just were like hey go perform and 
Right, uh, right, you right. Here's, here's your years. office, and yeah. hey, we're, we're giving you a chance. Now show, now pull yourself up and prove it. Yeah. Prove that you can do it, and and that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, and, 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 and there's a lot of jobs spoken. like that. And women get yeah. them, men get them. I mean, that you know that 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 bottom half of every league. Uh, where there's a lot of coaching churn, um, there's a reason there's a lot of coaching churn there. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, but I mean, the support comes in two ways. But then I think, like, yeah. if they can afford it, they, sh- I mean, financially supporting mm-hmm. the families, like helping the families out. To me, that's a big deal. So, Kevin, let's get back in the gym in terms of talking about your athletes. We've talked about how to best serve and support coaches. How do you manage comparison? I know with girls or young athletes, they're high achievers. They're definitely competitive. Stats are important. They're looking at stats. What do you do when, do they compare themselves to others? Do you have that come up at all? What, what's your thoughts on comparison? Yeah, um, that certainly is a natural thing that I think that they get into. You know, like they, when they first come, there's just a lot of comparison stuff. Um, I think the uncoupling of like who you are from like what you do, like that's, that's a, that's the first step. Like I mentioned, I think everything we get into, I'm going to mention that at some point because, right. because like, you know, I think the, I, I mean, I'll just tell you, I had an interesting conversation with Mackenzie Fidelic. So she's a player that was a top 20 recruit. She's never really played here. Right. So, and so like, there's a lot, of, there was a lot of that. She was fighting with comparisons and it, you know, like early on and, she finally came to terms with it. Like, look, I'm doing the best I can. I'm competing at the level. And then we've given her roles that she finds are really, really important that she can help the team. And so like we address it, like she's just had freaks that were ahead of her, you know, like that we had a six, six kid ahead of her. And then I got maybe one of the best athletes in NCAA and Kendall Kip that's in front of her. And so like, Mac, I'm sorry. I love you. You know, like you can, you can fight this battle in your head the whole time. Like why are they not playing? Or you could just, Go like, hey, look, I'm, I, what can I do to, uh, what can I offer the team to, to make sure that we're having success? And that's kind of where we always go. Like, hey, look, not everyone's meant to play. This is what it is, but you can still help the team. And so I think for me, role clarity, like, and just talking through that and being honest about it. A lot of times when I've had that conversation, just said like, look, you're not beating out Kendall Kip, Mac. Sorry, it's just not happening. But what can we do to, to help you? Here's, here's some ideas that I have for role clarity. Then all of a sudden they stop worrying about they've stopped worrying about that, and she's been able to go. Okay, here's here's how we can help us have success, and she's kind of leaned in that more. It gets a little bit more challenging when you have like real competition, which happens at times. <laughs> and so when that's happened, it's been much more about hey, this is tight. Like um, it's going to come down to the numbers, and so then the numbers because it's tight, like become useful actually, and something they can strive for as opposed to if Mackenzie looked at the numbers, that would be really would crush her soul. Like, because Kendall Kipps hitting 400 every day in practice and she's hitting 150 every day in practice or whatever, that's going to crush her soul. So like, look, you don't need to look at this, but for us, when there's actual comparisons, I think those objective numbers help them like, Hey, if we're going to do this, how can I get ahead? If I hit a little bit higher, maybe I got a chance to play. So that's how I've handled it is like either like role clarity. And if it is competition, then try to use those in a healthy way. Um, but also like, Hey, if you, if you're not playing, doesn't mean you're not, you're okay. Still like, let's, let's just figure out how to make the volleyball player side of you or whatever, however you want to frame that. Let's get that player playing at a higher level. Um, but let's make sure we're uncoupling that from who you are. Like you have so much more to offer regardless of what happens here. Yeah. How do you have the players that aren't on the court feel like they have great purpose and great impact for the team? Well, I meet with them a lot. So I, I meet with every one of them. I just had three meetings today like before this call. So for half hour, 45 minutes, we um, sometimes an hour, depending on, you know, what's going on, but I meet with every one of them once every two weeks and the things we talk about is their experience, you know, some, some identity stuff, um, how they're doing in school, you know, what we can do, like what resource I can connect them to. And then the other piece we talk about is this, like the only part that we really talk about volleyball is their roles and what they, you know, and how, and trying to create role clarity and constant communication on that and check in to see how they're feeling. And does this resonate with them? And do they feel like they're getting something out of this and that they're, you know, I talk a lot about, I don't ever want you guys to feel like we're using you up. So like, I don't want to just use you for a role. I want to make sure that this role that you're in is offering something that you can use in the future. And so that conversation is kind of a constant dialogue that we're happening and it's happening 
all year and for all four years, five years that they're with us. And so that's how I've handled is just really constant, very open and honest communication. And it's really hard for them as freshmen, but by the end of their senior year, even the kids that aren't playing, they were very comfortable having some real hard, hard conversations. You know, I mean, I got a kid that helped us win the national championship that I didn't have money for because of COVID, you know, like she had an extra year and wanted that. And I was able to tell her like, Hey, look, I, I don't, I can't, this isn't going to work out with what I have coming in. And she was just, thanks, Kevin. Thanks for telling me. And it was like, there was no drama because I think she knows that we've been able to have those conversations that are really hard conversations throughout our whole career. And she knows I care about her. It wasn't a personal thing. It was a business decision. And so we we're able to do that. So I think those conversations are the most important thing that I do. Everyone that's been on my staff would say the same thing, but that place is a place where we can kind of create that role clarity. So when conflict comes up, what, how do you manage it? Well, conflict can be very, very positive. Usually that's, we try to frame it that way. Um, you're talking about conflict between players or conflict between coaches and players or. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Just Cause they're inside competition. It brings out that fiery spirit of us and we can sometimes be our worst self inside competition. Yeah. And that's when that conflict can show up and you have such a, you know, for you environment and yet we're just going to be human and we're going to have that conflict. So how do you deal with it? Yeah. I would say the first thing that I do with conflict, the, the most important thing again is like how we respond in the gym when someone makes a mistake is that, even when there's conflict with me, I mean, I'll give you an example. This is I'll, I'll just, this is the best way I can tell you. I'll just tell a story if that's okay. Stories are more powerful. So Catherine Plummer, we lost to Washington in 19, 2019. And Catherine Plummer um, was struggling. She actually ended up, we ended up shutting her down after this because she had some injury stuff and that's why she was struggling. But um, so she was struggling. And after the match in front of the whole group, like we're talking and she's in front of the group says, Hey, Kevin, I was bad today, but you were worse. And so I was like, this is the culture I want, right? So I want them to feel them feel like they can say that. And I was like, tell me more, Catherine. She's like, your body language was terrible. Your responses were terrible. You were short with us. You've never been like that before. Like, what? Like, that's bullshit. Excuse my language, but that's, and I'm like, so my, in that moment, I, I responded and was like combative back and said, hey, Catherine, like, you know, screw you, like you, you know, like and got into it or got, took that like very personal or took it in a way that was like, um, yeah, combative or defensive. I think I would have never had that kind of feedback ever again. And that feedback was really important because she was 100% right. As I reflected on in that second, I was like, Catherine, you are 100% right. Like, I, I am sorry, you know, like, tell me more about it. Tell me how I can be better. We talked it out right in front of the whole group. And I was like, I can promise you like that will not happen again and I'll be better moving forward. So that's how I handle that conflict. And that's typically, that's, if things come to me like that, that's typically how I want to handle it, you know? And that's how, if something happens between staff, let's happen where it gets heated, I kind of calmly kind of intervene and then have the conversation and try to get a place of honesty and try to remove emotion as much as possible and then talk about it. Amongst players, um, you know, we talk a lot about like, why is this conflict happening? You, it's either happening because there's a personality issue between players. And so then let's start dealing with that. Or it's happening because someone really cares a lot about something, behaviors that are happening that need to change, right? So these behaviors are happening. And I don't, I don't, I think these behaviors are counter to what's going to allow us to be successful. Uh, I'm communicating that. And usually that communication is happening later than it should, and it's built up, and they're really frustrated. And so what we talk about as a group is this a concept of carefrontation. And they're like, if someone's confronting you on this, it's because they care. And so let's give this a moment. Like, if they're coming to you, let's see if we can remove emotions from this, listen to the message, um, and understand, like, they're telling me because they care about me as a human being, and they care about the success as a team. And so let's kind of try to frame it that way. And to be honest, that has been a complete game changer for us. Uh, we could not get, like, we could not get confrontation on the team. I, if I think about the team when I got here, my first year was 2017. They were deathly afraid of, of um, confrontation here. It was just like something they weren't comfortable with. And until we started framing it as confrontation, we, we weren't getting, we weren't getting the growth that we needed, to be honest. And then after we started talking about that, they would come up and be like, hey, Kevin, just so you know, we had a confrontation moment here. We had a confrontation moment here. Hey, can you help us here? We needed to have this confrontation, which to me as a guy, like, like I grew up in kind of a rougher neighborhood, like a rough area, like, like our confrontation was ended a lot with 
like physically, to be honest, if we're going to be honest, that seems very soft, but it doesn't matter. I got to meet them where they're at. And I feel like this has changed the way that we deal with things. And it's really been positive for our group. So, and I don't know about, I don't know how much you're dealing with young kids, but even I think young males don't want to confront each other as much as they used to back in the era that I grew up in. And I think that whole idea, that framing is really, I know it's helped us and it's helped others that I've shared that with. Yeah, that's a great, great gift. So Kathy, any other thoughts? This drives Kathy crazy because Kathy's like, carefortation is not like that, not where you're coming from, Kathy. Like, <laughs> yeah, I know. I can see your face. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, my answer to what are you doing today is trying to find somebody to fight with. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so Kevin, this has been a great treat. Oh. Thank you for your winning strategies. As we finish, what would you say are your top five things that you would like to just set the team up with so that they can go out and uh, win their day. If there is things that I think are important, you know, yeah. like that I would share, like, I think, like I mentioned, the, the uncoupling of who you are from what you do, I think is one of the most important things. And in coaching, I'd say it's the most important things in life. I think it's the most important thing for our athletes. Um, I think um, the other thing that I would want to take away is that um, we should assume that the people that are around want to be great. Uh, and that we that our job is that if we operate under that assumption, then you're going to come out of a place of like joy and love and care for those people, and that um, you're going to be better for them than if you think that they don't want to be great. If you operate out of the other place, then you're combative all the time, and it's not supportive. Mm -hmm. But if you operate of a place of like I assume that you want to be great, then we're operating out of a place of support as opposed to a place of conflict immediately. There's play, time and place for conflict. But I think that 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 space is I operate out of that space. And I think once I've made that realization, it's helped me a lot. And then um, I think care for patients is a great way to frame it with teams. I mean, I think that's a I think that's that's changed the way that I operate in our team. And it's more importantly changed the way that our team operates with each other. So, yeah, I would say I'd say that those are those are great winning strategies. So thank you, Kevin, Kathy, as always. And team, it's up to you. Go out and figure out how you want to win and set yourself up for great success and find joy and love on the journey. So you can go to howwomenwin.com for more information. Thank you.